Now let's do get into the book of Revelation. <laughs> then the angel showed me, chapter 22, the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Notice the throne of God and of the Lamb. <clears throat> we have a throne in which both God the Father and God the Son have equal right to. Now, does that speak to you in any way, shape, or form about the deity of Jesus Christ? I would say anybody that would sit on the throne of the Father, you know, sort of on his own authority, it would be more likely to be struck dead and if he wasn't and being authorized by this, this uh, his essence of DNA to be on that throne. We never see, of course, the Father, and never will for all eternity. He is simply a spirit, as is the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about them constantly, but there never is a visible manifestation of the Father. Uh, we have a visible manifestation of the Son, and for all eternity we will be able to look Him in the eye and talk to Him. He has clothed himself with a body that everything we can read in Scripture uh, suggests that he will never unclothe himself from that body, but he will possess that for eternity. It's not that it's, you know, r rationally or theologically or anything impossible that he, for him to unclothe himself from that body, having, you know, completed one task, I don't need that anymore, so to speak. But there is no indication that that will ever happen that he will sit on the throne in this new Jerusalem and that we will be able to commune with him. Any questions about that? We truly will be able to see Jesus when we get to heaven. Uh, so, this throne uh, is uh, uh, of God and the Lamb. That's chapter 3 and verse 21 uh, says... The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And so, it appears, there's a big throne, <laughs> that not only does the son sit on the throne, but the son says to the conqueror, the overcomer, uh, uh, Nikai Kumene, or something, I forgot how to pronounce the word. We get our, uh, our shoes, uh, Nike, uh, which means conquering, uh, from, uh, from this. The one who conquers, not only will we be in heaven with Christ, he is in some uh, sense, uh, not that we're deity and ever will be deity, but in some sense shares the glory of his deity uh, without us becoming deity. That makes sense to you? As we sit on that throne with him, just it's like a, I don't know if this is the best illustration in the world, like a kid that's invited to come up and sit from Santa Claus's, you know, Jerry's here at the grocery uh, uh, department stores and things like that. Uh, Got to be something like that, I suppose. Then there's the water of life uh, that's drawn to our attention. Uh, John 4 says this. Jesus addressed uh, this. He said, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. This is the eternal life water. that comes, its source is the throne of God or the person of uh, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is eternally uh, our uh, eternally quenches our uh, thirst and it's available to us forever. And he goes on to say about this uh, city and this uh, river, this water of life, that through the middle of the street of the city also and on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. So we have you know, these two symbols of life, the river of life and the tree of life. And it's like, I don't want you to miss the point. I'm talking to you about a place of life versus death. And uh, 
this tree of life, which we uh, envision in the garden as being one tree, it's uh, now like a forest of trees, so to speak. It lines this uh, highway that leads from the throne of God, at which a river runs, apparently, best I can tell from reading this, runs down the middle of the city, has the origin in, in the throne of God, and on <clears throat> both sides of the river, there is this highway, and on both sides of the highway, there's a tree of life grove, so to speak, of them. That's the image of everything about the picture screams life. And uh, intentionally so, of course. Yielding its fruit each month. Now, this isn't like apples that are, you know, January, February, March, a new crop each month. It is like apples in January, and February is peaches, and March is something else. It's, it's a variety of fruits. But to give, I think, the idea of just a complete range of fullness and richness of, uh, of what God has to offer us every month. Something new and great uh, for, for our benefit. As Adam and Eve were barred from the tree of life by the angel that uh, that was stood at the gate with a flaming sword. We, on the other hand, are introduced to groves of them to make it as easy as possible that we might drink and eat of that which gives life because uh, that's God's intent. Questions as we go? No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. The curse, of course, has been destroyed by Christ. It is done away with. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed it is everyone who hangs on a tree. There's no curse, uh, just like there was no curse in the, in, in the paradise of God. Remember, we said this is a new paradise. Paradise regained. And... And it is without curse. Uh, we, th we, there, uh, we are there to worship. Uh, and his servants will worship him. Now, you don't worship created beings. If you do, you're an idolater. And the point is, we're told here, as in so many places, and, and you've got to stand just a little bit amazed that people who cannot find the deity of Christ in Scripture... And they're not looking very hard. Your Jehovah's Witnesses are a good example of that. But we are told that we are to worship him. And then in verse 9, worship God. The him and the God, of course, are one and the same thing. The very fact of worship demands God, demands deity. And so we worship Jesus Christ for eternity. And they will see his face. And I've mentioned that before. They will see, you and I, we're the they, that will see his face. And uh, it's a very emotional subject. That face that was battered uh, with fits, and uh, in which uh, thorns were pressed down on that brow. Uh, that face that suffered, uh, that we might not suffer. That face will be there for us to gaze upon and adore and worship for all eternity. And his name will be on their foreheads. We read through the book of Revelation how the beast likes to mark, of course, his on the forehead and on the hand to imply in uh, thought and in deed they serve the Antichrist. And uh, God marks his own, of course. We studied that uh, as well. And it's drawn to our attention one more time that his name, <coughs> sort of like a, a branding of cattle, but in less painful fashion, his name is uh, uh, branded upon us, our forehead. And notice his forehead. It, it doesn't even mention hand. And maybe I'm making too much out of this when I uh, make the distinction. But the head is your thinking process. It's your believing process. And uh, the, I think the implication here is our faith will be straight and right and correct for 
ever will not get it wrong again, because his name is, you might say, embossed upon our foreheads. And that will be no more, implying, of course, that the exhaustion of the labor that God has uh, uh, brought us to as a result of the curse. Well, the curse is removed, and therefore the exhaustion, not the work, but the exhaustion of that work is removed. So much the fact, uh, so much so, that there's no need of night. We don't lose energy. We spend one third of our lives unconscious. You ever think of that point? One third of our lives unconscious, called sleep. Uh, and that will be eliminated. There will be no fatigue, there will be no state of unconsciousness and unawareness, which is what sleep is. There will be no state of, uh, which we're trying to get rejuvenated, because we'll never become unrejuvenated and need it. Uh, they will need no lamp or sun, but the Lord God will be their light and it will reign forever and ever. We reign. That's why uh, we talked about a few minutes ago sitting on his throne. You reign from a throne. And so it is God has ordained us to reign. Over what? It's not clear. But whatever it is, we are not brought into this heavenly condition to, to be second class citizens or some type of peon, so to speak. Not that it wouldn't be great to be there under any conditions, <laughs> mind you. But the fact of the matter is, we're told we will reign as kings. And we will judge, too, for that matter. We have a high and elevated calling from God. All out of uh, uh, proportion to what you think we should have. It's one thing to perhaps look at the angels who did not fall from their elevated position when tempted. Think, these are the ones that should be rewarded. These are the ones that should reign. Those that held to that position ordained by God and endured that temptation. And yet, for whatever reason, mysterious as it certainly is, it is us, this fallen ranks, that will be elevated back uh, to a, a, a level where we cannot fully grasp as we try to speak of, speak of it today. We'll reign and forever and ever. Never to forget that heaven is eternal in nature. Forever and ever and ever. If you, you know, on occasion, they don't happen often, but try to track with me. On occasion, <clears throat> you will have one of those incredibly unique days. It's often in the spring or perhaps in the fall when, you know, the, the sky is just right, the temperature is just right, it doesn't appear to be a problem in your life. These are not common days. Uh, but it, you just feel like you're walking on air. You ever had days, rarely have days like this, wonderful. And you can't hardly really remember exactly what it was like because it fades and it doesn't last very long, but you just remember, I remember, and I don't know if you did as well, you had these rare days and it's nice heaven-like, and your joy that you carry in your heart. Okay, you have that forever. That day appears forever in your life. You never have an off day. Now you meet, you know, you talk about somebody, some family member, some friend, or something not going right, quite right now, he's having an off day. Yeah, never going to have one. Nobody's ever going to be able to say that about you. Uh, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon to take place. That is Revelation 1.1 virtually all over again. <clears throat> he is summing up now by going back through the first few verses of the book of Revelation and saying that the angel was sent to show Dekanumi uh, I guess a visual picture. Uh, John saw uh, visions of, you know, of the things that were brought before his eyes and his ears. And uh, we're, we're in summary told that. And 
has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. We, we have bookends, which I like to call them in the book of Revelation, where it starts out where the author says over and over again that he's going to tell us some things that are soon to take place. The time is near. And things of this nature. And then we get to the end of the book of Revelation, saying them again. Just in case you didn't get the point, these things are soon to take place. Chapter 7, Behold, I am coming soon. Uh, chapter, uh, verse 12, excuse me. Behold, I am coming soon. And uh, verse 20, uh, Surely I am coming soon. Now, I would ask you, if the Lord wanted to make the point that he was coming soon, how in the world would he make it if this wasn't it? How can you read chapter 1, chapter 22 of his repeated use of various terms and vocabulary and phrases that he is coming soon and get done and say, and that means he's coming in two or three thousand years. What type of mental disease would you have to have to come up with that conclusion? He said he's coming soon. And he did. And that's the whole point. Now, I'm not saying the book of Revelation, all of it is about things that happen soon. We pointed out to you at various points between um, chapters 4 and uh, 19 where the author takes us from his current context and he transforms us into the future, give us a glimpse of heaven and the things to come. And when he gets to chapter 20, 21 and 22, he really give, transforms us to, get a, to give us a glimpse of the in detail, of the greatness of that which is yet ahead. But unless we miss the point, before he concludes the book, he says, in essence, this book, for the most part, not the parts where I took you, you know, into heaven and the distant future, but the, the basic theme and essence of the book and my coming in judgment is to be sent. And that's the point that you just simply don't want to miss. Look at verse 11. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right. And the holy still be holy. That making sense to you? A lot of people confuse. What do you mean still be filthy? And I thought we we're supposed to call people to repentance, and I thought no, oh, they be filthy. That's fine. Uh, there is symbolism. There is poetry here that's saying this: the things that I have been discussing with you are so near, you don't have time to change. You see the poetic. Uh, way that John is expressed. That's, another, that's my point. That's another verse that shows the nearness of what's going to take place. It's so close. Just continue to be what you're going to be. You don't have time to change. Not that, in fact, the person couldn't have repented thereafter. It's a poetic tool to express the closeness and nearness of what is about to take place. Do you get that? I hope. You say, that, that verse could have been very easily, utterly incomprehensible to you most of your life. But in the light of what, the way I just explained it, they say, oh, well that makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's some type of poetic tool to make the point of the nearness of about of what is about to happen. Right? Then verse 15, he says, uh, well, uh, uh, verse 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes. Now, we remember from chapter 7, verse 14, we wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. And that's how we, of course, become believers. So that they may have the right uh, to the tree of life. A right is exousia in Greek, and it's the same word in which Christ uh, John talks of Christ in the gospel and said he came unto his own and his own received him not but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become the sons of God or the authority it's really authority is a very good translation authority is something like this we don't have in, in our natural condition especially our fallen condition we don't have 
authority to enter the, uh, heaven and, and, and to participate in the things of God. But he gives us that authority. We have the authority to the tree of life, the right to it, to eat it and to never die. It has been said that the reason God did not want Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of life after they fall is that they could never die and therefore could never be redeemed from their fallen state. You understand what I'm trying to say? And so he barred them so that they could die and be regenerate and, have, and experience the resurrection. And us having experienced that resurrection, eat, and we never die thereafter. Uh, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Now, who enters the city by climbing over the wall? Christ talked about this in some of his uh, parables. That's the thief and, and, and such like, uh, who would sneak over or under the wall. But uh, the point is, you have a right, you have authority to enter into this city through the gate, which is never clad. Uh, and then he says, outside are dogs and saucers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. That list is relatively the same as in the last chapter, verse 8, where it talked about those that are going to hell. With the addition of this phrase, the dogs. Now, the Bible is not characteristically a book of name-calling. We tend to be char characteristically people who call names. Uh, you, you may not even notice how readily we do that, how readily preachers do that, and such like. We like to call each other names. You know, that, and sometimes they're very theological names, that, you know, that liberal guy over there in that other church. Well, liberal is a title, but it can, be, it can become a, not a title, but a a designation of a theology, but it become a, 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 a dirty name. Oh, he's liberal, snarl, you know, you say. Uh, we have a tendency to call people names. Christ forbid it. And uh, the Sermon on the Mount, by the way. He said, uh, you don't call people raka or empty-headed or fool. You remember that? Because you're in danger of hellfire. Think about that. I mean, how many ugly names have you called people in your lifetime? Uh, and they were worse than that. And yet Christ said, you're in danger of hellfire, to use those terms, because uh, it reflects a heart of hate to call names. And that's why you're in danger of hellfire. It, it, it implies you may not be a believer. But here is something that some people think, well, that's just a name, you know, those dirty dogs over there. It's not. This term was used in the uh, Hebrew culture and uh, in the book of Deuteronomy in association with Sodomites. And so uh, that is uh, apparently the, mean, the meaning here. Uh, when he's a list of sins and dirty dogs, so to speak, isn't, you know, that's sort of humorous, if anything. It's not part of the seriousness of this list. But when you understand that when he's speaking of dog Sodomites, that fits the context of the evil of the list it just has given us. Make sense to you? Uh, <clears throat> now, again, verse 20, surely I am coming soon, and he ends the book. Uh, so to make the point again, this book was given, uh, written, uh, about 62 um, to uh, 67, 65, round and there, A.D., uh, by John, to things that were soon to take place. Those things did take place very soon, perhaps within months after it was written, in which the uh, commission from Nero to destroy uh, Jerusalem was uh, given, and the uh, destruction of the church in, in Jerusalem because of the burning of the city of Rome. All of these things began to take place in the very near future. It was soon to take place. So, and they did. They took place in the destruction.
destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. That's the basic theme. That's, that's, that's a simplification, but it's the basic theme of the book of Revelation. And now uh, that has come and gone, uh, and uh, the author's telling of the story. But it hasn't come and gone in terms of the historical fact. He's still somewhere around 65 AD as he finishes the book. And wants us to understand, now this is soon to take place. So he reiterates that in the last few verses again. Are you buying into this? Does it make sense to you? Or are you thinking, no, I think Jack Fernandez has it right. <laughs> that, that, that's a good point that you make about none of the uh, books of the Bible mention the destruction of Jerusalem, which would have been, you know, would have been something, it, it's the biggest thing, event in their lives, um, the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and so, oftentimes, Revelation is listed as being written around 80, 90 or so, even. About 90, yeah. And uh, you would think that uh, there would be, if that had happened, now, obviously, there would have been some mention in the past tense of the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, in fact, the Jerusalem is mentioned in the present tense, and the temple in the present tense, in the book of Revelation, uh, indicating that these ugly things have not occurred yet. No book of the Bible, of course, does, like you say, mention a destruction of Jerusalem. And there are liberals. In the past, liberals have been had an effort to try to extend the writing of the New Testament books as far as they could into the future, because they wanted them to put them in context in which uh, uh, people who had no idea what really happened 100, 150 years ago you know, wrote them. Uh, but in fact, there are liberals who are now uh, insisting that it is utterly inconceivable that any book in the New Testament could have been written after the destruction of Jerusalem at 70 AD, AD 70, simply because none of them mention it. And that in itself is adequate argument to insist According to liberals, let alone, you know, orthodox Christian, in and of itself, quite adequate to insist nothing was written after AD 70. You can't write a, a book in the New Testament uh, and not mention this event if it had occurred. That's their point and my point as well. So it is, uh, there's a lot of mainstream, not only in orthodox Christianity, although most of that's dispensational, but even in liberalism in recent years, they have been increasingly bringing back the date for the writings of these the books, uh, even so far as, you know, uh, 65 AD. And I, I think all of them were written before the destruction of Jerusalem. I don't necessarily think Revelation was the last one written. But the other had to have been quick. Perhaps 2 Timothy was the last one written. <clears throat> Perhaps Hebrews was the last one written. Read those books and see the proximity to bad things that the author is describing. The author of Hebrews, you, you know, you just, you, I sometimes feel, he's read Revelation, and he's retelling some of it. And, 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 and Paul, that's the most moving book Paul ever wrote, the second Timothy, by far. He knows he's going to die, and he knows he's going to die soon. And the book just, this, you know, move your soul to read it. It's nothing like anything he ever wrote before. And, of course, that was about 68, I believe, when he died. Any questions?